well to the cause thou art chosen. Be earnest, be watchful and wise. Remember to pass up before thee and both thy intention in fight, but one lead it on to destruction, the order to joy and the light. God help you to follow his banner and serve him wherever you go. And when you are tempted, my brother, God give you No matter what others may do, stand firm in the strength of the Master. Be loyal, be faithful and true. Each trial will make you the if you in the name of the Lord fight manfully under your leader, obeying the voice of his word. God help you. Oh
Let us pray. Our Father, we pray that in time of temptation, time of deception, time of persecution, you'll help us to be loyal, you'll help us to take our stand, you'll give us the grace to say no to the devil. Lord, we're praying that we'll be disciples indeed, people who know you, people who love you, and people who are willing to stand for the faith anywhere, anytime. And stand manfully, truthfully, loyally unto you. Father, we pray that this morning you'll speak to our hearts. You'll grant us the grace ever to remain willingly obedient unto you. Always to say no to the voice of the tempter. In Jesus' name we pray. We're sharing the word of God this morning concerning what the Bible has to say on true discipleship. In John chapter 8, reading from verse 30, And as he spake these words, many believed on him. Then said Jesus to those Jews which believed on him, If ye continue in my word, then are ye my disciples indeed. And ye shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. In the world in which we live today, there is a lot of religion, and a lot of zeal, a lot of activities, a lot of things that go along with religious people. But then the thing that ought to take a priority, arrest our attention, is what the Lord meant when he called for disciples. Over here he says that if only we continue in his word, then are we his disciples indeed. And then we'll know the truth, and the truth will make us free. Jesus spoke this to those who believed. They believed on him. And it is necessary for us to understand that the gateway into discipleship, the entrance into the life of discipleship, is being born again, believing on the Lord Jesus Christ, having a change of life, and thereby starting a life of loyalty, faithfulness, obedience to the commandments of the Lord, which makes us disciples of the Lord Jesus Christ. You may be a disciple of a hero, of a man, of a religious leader. But that may not constitute you or make you a disciple of the Lord Jesus Christ. People are disciples in those days. But those disciples who were not disciples of Jesus Christ, a lot of them manifested the evidence that they were not born again. And the heroes of the leaders of the world will take any disciple if they can be zealously involved in propagating a particular cause, but Christ will have nothing to do in terms of discipleship with those who have not been born again. In John chapter 9, from verse 26, Then said they unto him, What did he to thee? How opened he thine eyes? He answered them, I have told you already, and ye did not hear. Wherefore would ye hear it again? Will ye also be his disciples? The question of this man suggests and implies that these were not disciples of Jesus Christ. Why? He said, I've told you the word already. I've given you the testimony already. I've declared unto you the marvelous work of Christ. You have not accepted, you have not believed, you have not heard, you have not acknowledged who Christ is, what Christ has done, and what Christ means to God and to man. Why do you want to hear it again? Will you, in hearing it, 
then acknowledge, accept, and believe, and then become his disciples? Very, very clear that this man was saying, that because you have not heard, you have not acknowledged and believed, you are not his disciple. If you want to hear it again, I want to know whether you want to believe or not. If you will believe, I know that you really want to be his disciple. How did they reply? Verse 28. Then they reviled him and said, Thou art his disciple. But we are Moses' disciples. They were not converted. They did not accept the will of God, the way of God, the word of God. Neither will they acknowledge the work of God. And he said pointedly, We are not his disciples. You are his disciple. You believe him. You have tasted of the work of grace that he did on your body. But we do not accept him. We are not his disciple. We are disciples of Moses. Which means then, you can be a disciple of man and have a hero that you choose, religious hero, whether past or present. And yet, you may not be a disciple of the Lord Jesus Christ. In Matthew chapter 22, reading from verse 15. Then when the Pharisees and took counsel, how they might entangle him in his talk, and he said out unto him, Their disciples were the Herodians, saying, Master, we know that thou art true, and teachest the way of God in truth. Neither carest thou for any man, for thou regardest not the person of men. Tell us therefore, what thinkest thou? Is it lawful to give tribute unto Caesar or not? But Jesus perceived their wickedness and said, Why tempt ye me, ye hypocrites? Verse 16. They sent out unto him their disciples. Pharisees had disciples. But these were not born again. Their hearts were full of wickedness. And they were set a trap, a snare, for the Lord Jesus Christ. With their mouth, they will pay some honor and respect unto the Lord. Master, we know thou art true. And teachest the way of God in truth. Which means, becoming a disciple of Jesus goes beyond making an open confession. That is not arresting your heart. Which means it touches on your motive. Whether you really believe or you do not believe. Even though they said these qualities or characteristics of Christ, they said it tempting. They had a wrong motive. And they wanted to trap Jesus Christ. And then he told them that they were like their masters, the Pharisees. They were hypocrites, but not his disciples. We learned then, a man may zealously follow up a religious cause, may not be a disciple of Jesus. A man may say that he accepts Moses, and the writing of Moses. And he very carefully lives by the writing of Moses. The Old Testament may not be a disciple of Jesus Christ. A man may even say some good things about the life of Christ, the ministry of Christ, the characteristics of Christ. And openly and outwardly, he might seem to say nothing wrong about Christ. He may not be a disciple of Christ until he's born again. Come back again to John chapter 8 verse 30. And he spake these words, as he spake these words, many believed on him. Then said Jesus to those Jews which believed on him, if ye continue in my word, then are ye my disciples indeed. So, the very first thing we understand is that those who are disciples of Jesus have repented of their sins, all their sins. They have believed the gospel he preached, the gospel he gave to the apostles, the gospel that the apostles recorded down and wrote in the Bible. So, they have believed the word. 
One, they have believed the written word. And two, they have believed the word, the living word. In the beginning was the word. The word was with God, the word was God. They have believed that word that became flesh and dwelt among us. And we beheld his glory. They've seen part of that glory. And they have tasted of that part of grace and truth, of which that word incarnate is full. And so the disciples of Christ are those who have given up their ways of sin, their lives of sin. They have embraced, they have believed, they have accepted, they have acknowledged Jesus as Savior. But it goes beyond that. That you have only accepted Jesus Christ as Savior in Luke chapter 6, reading verse 40. The disciple is not above his master, and everyone that is perfect shall be as his master. Here the Lord Jesus himself said that disciples are people who endeavor to be like the master. Who will not endeavor to be above the master, but will be a follower of the master? Which means the disciple is like Christ. That's all his goal. That's his ambition. The disciple is not above his master, but everyone referring to the disciple that is perfect, that is complete, lacking in nothing, totally following after the Lord Jesus Christ will endeavor to be as his master. The intention of a disciple is not to be like any other, but to be like Jesus Christ. And so, as we begin to examine our own hearts, wanting to find out who we believe in, what hero we are following, or which hero we are following, then we begin to realize whether we are disciples of Jesus or not. One point is clear, that if we are disciples of Jesus, we must have been born again. We must be following according to the word of the Lord. And it must be the settled, established purpose of our hearts to live like Christ, not like any other. Look at Matthew chapter 15, reading verses 1 and 2. Then came Jesus to scribes and Pharisees which were of Jerusalem, saying, why do thy disciples transgress the tradition of the elders? For they wash not their hands, which when they eat bread. Mark chapter 7. Mark chapter 7, verse 5. Then the Pharisees and scribes asked him, Why walk not thy disciples? according to the tradition of the elders, but eat bread with unwashing hands. The disciples lived a life that pleased and satisfied Jesus Christ. And they went against every tradition of every elder in the land. Religious elders, community elders, in social circles. So which means that for a disciple of Jesus Christ, he has thrown overboard the traditions of men. One, a disciple of Jesus Christ does not care, is not concerned about the traditions of men and women in his tribe, in his state, in his immediate community, or even in the whole nation. He is not concerned watching after the superstition of the land. If you find a person that is still meticulously following after the tradition of some tribal people, then you realize that that individual has not really known the Lord. If a worker or a member of the church of the living God will set the word of God aside and then take to the tradition of his people, the tradition of the local people, the tribal people, or that stage, and we'll say, oh yes, I'm going to church, I'm even working in the church, but I mustn't forget the tradition of our people. Let no man deceive you. It's not a disciple of Jesus Christ. The disciples of Jesus Christ have nothing to do 
Well, the traditions of the elders, the traditions of people around, the traditions of the community that oppose or contradict the word of God, the traditions that make the word of God of none effect. And so we need to understand that disciples of Jesus Christ are people who want, they are forsaking their sins. Two, they are forsaking the traditions of men. They are forsaking everything that will contradict the stated, written word of the living God. In Luke chapter 5 and verse 33, And he said unto him, Why do the disciples of John fast upon and make prayers? And likewise the disciples of the Pharisees, but dine, eat, and drink. It was very clear to every observer, every onlooker, that the disciples of Jesus Christ were different from the disciples of other denominational leaders. Take John the Baptist, for example. It wasn't that John the Baptist was false. It wasn't that John the Baptist did not love God. It wasn't that John the Baptist was following after any wrong doctrine, but he did not have the full, complete revelation of the Lord. He, he saw in part. He knew a little. And he was following after the Lord to the limit of the light that he had received. He taught his disciples prayer. He taught his disciples how to fast. He taught his disciples in the limit of all that he knew. But the disciples of Jesus, they didn't follow after the disciples of John the Baptist. There are people that do not know Jesus Christ in fullness. There are religious people and there are churches. We call them gospel churches. They may be called full gospel church. They may be called Pentecostal church. They may be called evangelical church. But as you get in, as you look at them, as you see what they stand upon, you doubt very much if they ever quote, if they ever read, if they ever study 5% of biblical revelation. If they ever get into some books of the Bible, you wonder, you doubt. And if they ever get to some chapters of the Bible, you wonder, you doubt. There are great chunks of scripture that they will omit. Just bypass, just overlook. But they take a little here. A little there but the full revelation they will not accept and they have their disciples but a real disciple of the lord jesus christ will take everything that the word of god is saying and will not follow after the disciples of john even though john has some limited revelation but then if you are endeavoring to be the disciple of the lord jesus christ you do not follow after the people that take 5% of biblical revelation or they take only 10% of biblical revelation or they divide the Bible into different dispensations and they say, well, this is not for today, that is not for today, that is not for us. If you are a real disciple of the Lord Jesus Christ, a disciple indeed, a true disciple, you say, what does the Lord say? What will the Lord do? You will not allow somebody that says, well, I'm also religious, I'm also even born again. Even though I do not take everything in the Bible, I do not understand everything in the Bible, but this I know, that I've accepted Jesus as my personal Savior. You don't follow after such people if you are a real disciple of the Lord. And so, you look up to the Lord yourself and say, I want the full revelation. What did Jesus say? That a true disciple is in doctrine, in practice, in worship, in fellowship, in the pattern of life. Let's go back to John again. John chapter 8, the true disciple. From verse 31, Then said Jesus to those Jews which believed on him. There are many times that people misunderstand the word of God. And what is addressed to the believers? They are unbelievers. Oh, they say, I cannot take that while well, we're speaking to the believers. And if you are there this morning and you hear some things I'm saying concerning the fact that a child of God 
does not take anything of the traditions of men, of the traditions of a tribe, of the tradition of some local people, but you take just the word of God and you say, I don't like that. Well, it wasn't meant for you. It was meant for a child of God. It wasn't meant for people who are hypocrites. It wasn't meant for people who are disciples of Pharisees. It wasn't meant for people who have not really entered into the kingdom of God. You may hear the word of God and will say, this is what the Bible says on marriage. You say, I don't accept that. It wasn't meant for you. It was meant for a child of God. Somebody who had believed on the Lord Jesus Christ. You know, there were times that Jesus spoke to his own disciples. He took the liberty and he spoke to his own. He said, Father, these are the ones who have given me. I've given them your word. And they have known that I came from you. And then when he rose from the dead, all those 40 days, he appeared to his own disciples alone, showing them many infallible proofs and speaking to them concerning the kingdom of God. Now a Pharisee may hear all that he said during that time that he showed himself by many infallible proofs. And he'll say, we don't accept that. Don't accept. It's not meant for you. It's meant for disciples. It's meant for the people that want to make heaven their home. It's meant for people that have believed on the Lord Jesus Christ and they want to continue in the words of the Lord so that they can be the disciples of the Lord Jesus Christ indeed. There are many religious people and sometimes they stray into our gathering. There are many people that carry the Bible but they never read it. Sometimes they stray into our meetings. There are many people that are coming from another church, another denomination. And then some of our leaders, who themselves, they are disciples of Jesus, they are children of God, but they are not matured enough themselves. They see these people and immediately, they say, become a worker in our church. Some people may be here today, that you've come from another place, but you've now, you have started worshipping in deeper life. But in your mind, you're still a Pharisee. In your mind, you're still a follower of a hero, like Herod. And now you, are, you say, but I'm a worker. And I just joined the church a few months ago. Then you hear the word of God. You say, well, I don't think I agree with that. Thank God you don't agree. Now you have shown you are not part of the people of God. Now you have shown you are not a disciple of Christ. Now you have shown that you just came out of a religious community and religious setting. You came into the church and some immature leader puts you there. It is your reaction to the word of Christ, the word of the Lord, the word of the King of Kings, the word of the Lord of Lords, the word of Master of Angels and Men, the word of the person that has authority in heaven, on earth, under the earth. Is your reaction to his word that shows whose disciple you are. The one into whose hand the Father has committed all authority and all judgment. And the Father judges no man, but he has committed all judgment into the hand of Jesus Christ, the very Son of God. It is your attitude to his word that will show whose disciple you are. And here it says, Then Jesus said, to those Jews which believed on him. If ye continue in my word, then are ye my disciples indeed. Then are ye my disciples indeed. Jesus Christ emphasized the fact that just raise up your hand on a crusade, in a revival meeting, or in a particular place, and say you are prayed and you are saved. That's not an evidence you are a disciple indeed. There are many people that tell us they are saved. They never continue in the word of God. But it is only when you continue in the word of God that it shows that you are a disciple indeed. I must ask you, have you continued in the word of Jesus Christ? He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. Have you been immersed in water? And you have been baptized in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost, well, I don't accept that. You are not part of his disciples. After you've come into the church, he taught his disciples. He said, go into all the world. Preach to all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all that I commanded you. You know what he commanded? Be ye perfect 
as your Father in heaven is perfect. Is that perfection, bitch? I don't agree with. That sanctification thing, that's what I don't agree with. What I believe is that there's only one work of grace. You are saved, you are forever saved. I believe that sanctification is, you know, as you're going on and you're mixing with the children of God, then by and by you're improving yourself, you're becoming better gradually and progressively. That's what I accept. Well, you've now shown who you are. Not one of his disciples. If ye continue in my word, then are ye my disciples indeed. Tarry in Jerusalem. Until ye be endued with power from on high. For John truly really baptized with water. But he shall be baptized in the Holy Ghost not many days hence. And he asked him, Sir, will you at this time bring the kingdom back to Israel? And he said, It's not for you to know. The time of the season that the Father has placed in his hand. But ye shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost has come upon you. And ye shall be witnesses unto me both in Jerusalem and Judea and in Samaria unto the uttermost part of the earth. And when the day of Pentecost was fully come, they were assembled together, sitting in one place. And then there was this rushing mighty wind. And it filled the house where they were sitting. And then cloven tongues of fire lighted upon them. And they were filled with the Spirit and began to speak in tongues. And the Spirit gave utterance. Well, is that speaking in tongues? I don't agree with you. You are not one of them. Because, you know, it says, If ye continue in my word, then are ye my disciples indeed. Before he went away, he did say, that these signs shall follow them that believe. In my name, they cast out devils. In my name, they lay hands on the sick, they shall recover. Well, you see, it's uh, on this uh, believing God and God healing you, and it's on this casting out of devils I don't agree with. I don't agree that there are even demons, evil spirits, familiar spirits, or anything like that. You are not part of his own. If ye continue in my word, then are ye my disciples indeed. Watch and pray that you fall not into temptation. The spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. Well, all this, uh, careful, careful, careful. Watch yourself, watch your tongue, watch your word, watch your action, watch your thoughts, watch your habits, and watch everything that you are doing. Well, watching too much, I just like to live a free life, a life of liberty. You are not part of his own. He commanded watch. He commanded pray. He commanded that you should watch so that you do not fall into temptation. And you say you don't accept watching. You do not accept. You must be vigilant over your tongue, over your action, over your words, over your habit, over your relationship between men and women. You say you don't want to watch. There's nothing you are watching. You are saved. You are forever saved. You can talk any way you like. You can do anything you like. You can act any way you like. You can go into a sister's house or a brother's house in the night and you can do anything. God has given us liberty. And so you are a careless hypocrite. You live anyhow. No watching. I don't agree with that watching. You are not a disciple of Christ. If ye continue in my word, then are ye my disciples indeed. When you bring your gift to the altar and you remember there that somebody has ought against you, leave your gift right there at the altar and go back and reconcile with thy brother. And then after you've done that, come back again. Restitution. I thought that was under the law. Ah, we, now to, we apologize every time. You offend that one, you apologize. Offend that one, I apologize. No, no apology to anybody. I know Jesus has saved me. You are not a disciple. On the last day, you'll be surprised. Why call ye me Lord, Lord? And do not the things I say. Don't you know that if ye continue in my word, then are ye my disciples indeed. Now if somebody offends you, what does Jesus say? He says, go and tell him of his fault. He look, no, not me. I'll never tell that man. Tell him that he offended me. He has eyes to see. He has a mind to think. He is a human being too. He should know that that thing offended me. If he doesn't come, I will not go to him. I know who I believe. You don't know. And then eventually, maybe the person even came and said, I'm sorry, I think now that I can recollect I offended you. Well, go and settle it with God. Why are you sorry? Why are you coming to me? Is this the time to come to me? Go and settle with the Lord. Please now, brother. No, please go your way. I'm a child of God. I don't pull trouble with anybody. I don't have anything to forgive anybody. Go your way. Sister, don't act like that. Are we not children of God? Uh, 
before you knew what it meant to be a child of God, I was a child of God already. That's a disciple. When Jesus said, if they come back to you seven times in a day, and seven times in a day they say, oh, I'm sorry, my sister. I'm sorry, my brother. He says, you should forgive them. But you don't have forgiveness in your own doctrine. You don't have forgiveness in your own pattern of life. If ye continue in my word, then are ye my disciples indeed. And ye shall know the truth. And the truth will you free. Error will bring you into bondage. False doctrine will bring you into bondage. Look at Acts chapter 2 verse 42. Acts 2 42. And they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine. Those were disciples indeed. They gave their lives to the Lord. They that gladly received this word were baptized. And the same day there were added unto them about 3,000 souls. And all these 3,000, they continued in the apostles' doctrine. They continued in the apostles' doctrine. Oh, you say, I wish I knew what those doctrines were. They're recorded in Romans. They're recorded in 1st and 2nd Corinthians. They're recorded in Galatians. They're recorded in Ephesians. They're recorded in all the epistles. They're recorded in the New Testament. That's the doctrine of the apostles. What Jesus Christ gave to them. What he gave to them when he was here on earth. And then he said, I've not told you everything yet. When the Spirit is come, he will teach you and tell you all things. Then the Spirit came and told them all the apostles' doctrine. And when these people were born again, when he gave their lives to the Lord, we're told that all of them, 3,000, all the people there were called believers, they continued. Now that you have a church of 3,000 and only 1,000 people are continuing, in the apostles' doctrine, in the word of God, then you have 2,000 other people that believe whatever they like. That's not discipleship. But they continued in the apostles' doctrine. Look at Jude, verse 3. Beloved, when I gave all diligence to write unto you of the common salvation, it was needful for me to write unto you and to exhort you that you should earnestly Content for the faith, which was once delivered unto the saints. Continue in the word of God. Continue in the word of God. What we believed many years ago, if we're still continuing, then we'll still believe the same thing today. But if before we believe that you must repent before you are born again, but now we don't believe that you must repent, just raise up your hand. Jesus is good. Jesus is loving. Don't tell them about repentance. They run away. The church will not grow. Will not get many members. There will be nobody to contribute money and build our church. We want to build a large, big church building. So just receive the Lord as your personal savior. How about repentance? No, not at all. Well, sir, pastor, I was uh, talking with one of the members. And one of the members said that before I can really prove that I'm born again, I must show the evidence of repentance by restitution. And he told me this and that. Who is the worker that told you that? Then you mentioned that worker, so and so area leader. Call him for me. Why did you tell him about restitution? You want to drive him away? Why did you tell him he must repent of all his sins? The preaching I preached to them, that they should raise up their hands, that's not enough. The one I told them, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, that's final, that's the end, that's not enough. Area leader, and you're going to tell them about repentance and restitution again. If you tell them again like that, I will discipline you. The pastor has backsliding. It's not continuing the word of God anymore. All he wants now is crowd. All he wants now is people gathering together. All he wants is an usher just counting heads and saying, that's one of them. That's one of us. That's one of us. That's one of us. That's in the kingdom. That's in deeper life. That's in our church. Look at how large our church is. That's church or mixed multitude. That's church or hypocrites. That's church or a group of wood for eternal fire. But when you believe the word of God, earnestly contending for the faith which was once delivered to the saints. And so it means, number one, to be a disciple. It means that we must take the whole word of God in its entirety, in its totality. We must stand by that word of God. Let's go back to Matthew chapter 16. I'm reading from verse 24. 
Then said Jesus unto his disciples, unto his disciples, I must emphasize that again, that this afternoon, the Lord is talking to his own disciples, the people who accept him as master, the people who accept, accept him as captain of their salvation, those who know him as Lord, those who will bend the knee for him as to a king, those who will give him the reverence that he will give a person that is able to lead as a leader. That's, those are the people that the Lord himself is talking to. Then said Jesus unto his disciples, If any man come after me. You know this is a terrible thing among religious people. And they will say, Oh yes, we are we're deep alive, but we are evil. And so there, are some, there should be some differences. Why do those people at the headquarters church, don't they know that there is a difference between Yorubas and Igbos? There are some things that bring us in common, but there are other things that we cannot be in common. We must do it like we do it in our native land. You are not a disciple, just deceiving yourself. If any man, Igbo or Ethic, if any man, Ausa or Yoruba, any man that believes on the Lord Jesus Christ as Savior, as Lord, if any man will come after me, that is the person that actually wants to follow the Lord everywhere that he goes. He says, if any man will come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. What do we learn about discipleship? Discipleship means that we deny ourselves. Do you know many people like that who deny themselves? I don't. The people that deny themselves of the loss of the flesh, the pride of life, and the loss of the eyes, the people that deny themselves what the flesh is looking for, look at them outside. They tell us they are born again. They wear badges that they are saved. Every time their flesh makes a demand on them, they go to the prostitute and they tell us they are born again. They are not disciples of Christ. Look at the people. Every time there is an information they hear, and there is something gingering them, moving them, motivating them, driving them and leading them, say it out, say it out. There is no control on their tongue. Anything they hear, anything their heart is engineering them to say, that is what they say. No self-control. And they are not denying themselves. Where is the discipleship? They are not disciples of the Lord Jesus Christ. Don't you, t don't you know those people that say, well, I'm born again. It's only that once in a while, I take wine. Once in a while, because you say I was a heavy drunkard before. Now that I'm born again, do you think that I will leave everything all of a sudden? And so once in a while, I have it in the fridge. I think it's better to drink it privately at home and not go outside to make a fool of myself and put our church to shame. Your church? Which one is your church? You've not got a church yet. You've not got a church yet. If you're still drinking in secret and you cannot deny self, you cannot deny uh, your body of anything your body is looking for, you take. If it's alcohol, you take. If it's cigarette, you take. If it's women, you get in. If it's a man, you get in. Or there is no self-denial at all. What does that mean for you? It means you are not yet following Christ. It says, if any man will come after me, let him deny himself. But it's more than that. I see a lot of things in Bible days that demands denial on self. As I look at the journey of the children of Israel, going from Egypt all through to the land of Canaan, I see a lot of self-denial there because they were being led by the cloud and by the fire. They might be sleeping in the night and then the pillar of fire will be lifted up. And then that means that Israel must rise up immediately. It doesn't matter whether afternoon, whether evening or whether in the night. They have to rise up. Do you know that's a great deal of self-denial? Do you know there are people, you cannot tell them that we will have a particular meeting in the church at a particular time. Or they say, that doesn't fit into my schedule. I can't do that. Well, I'm a Christian, but I won't allow a pastor to be regulating my life. The time I should have gone to do this and do that, they tell us now, up, move, evangelism is starting, not me. I'm a member of the church, but I won't take that from anybody. You're not a member yet. 
you are aware there is a church. You are aware there is God. You have the awareness there is Christ. But the awareness doesn't mean that you have got an experience with God. If any man come after me, let him deny himself. You'll deny yourself of what you like to say. Have you ever found in our churches in the States, a state overseer will call the people, and a state overseer will say, uh, now, this year or this period, this is what I believe the Lord is leading the church to do. And you'll find somebody, he thinks he's being vocal, this person that is not going to talk, he thinks he's being bold. He's just proving that he's not a disciple of Christ. And he will say, well, state overseer, we thank you for what you have said, but I feel, what do you feel? Deny your feelings. I think, why do you think? Cancel that thought. And I am of the opinion, opinion for a disciple. Did you ever hear that in the Bible? That a disciple had a personal, private, selfish opinion somewhere. Why not cancel that and prostrate before the Almighty God and say, God, that thing doesn't suit my flesh. That, doesn't, that thing doesn't suit my program. But I have to deny self. To show that I'm a disciple of the Lord Jesus Christ. And you find people that go about and they say, No, we're not going to do that. No, we're not going to accept that. You're not going to do that. Why are you denying yourself? If you ask me why I deny myself, I can tell you. I can tell you stories of self-denial. Instances of self-denial. Evidences of self-denial from morning till night. But you don't have any testimony, any evidence that you ever deny yourself what you know to say, but which you can't say. Discipleship will not allow you. What you know to pass across as a private, personal, selfish opinion. Self-denial, discipleship will not allow you. You are, you are controlled. The yoke of the master is upon your neck, is upon your heart. And you say, Lord, not as I will. How can I do what I will? My will is swallowed up in his will. My will is cancelled in the will of the Almighty God. Oh Lord, not as I will, but as thou wilt. That's discipleship. He led the way. And so there must be self-denial. Look at Romans chapter 15. Romans chapter 15. From verse 1. We then that are strong ought to bear the infirmities of the weak and not to please ourselves. Husband and wife, do you know that to be a disciple, there are a lot of things that will demand self-denial at home. A lot of things. A lot of things. Strong man. You ought not to please yourself, but notice the infirmities of the weak wife. So that you are not pleasing yourself. But the husband that will say, I demand this, I want this, I require this. If he doesn't get my way, wife, even though I am of deeper life, I'll drive you out. Damn the consequence. You are not a disciple. Oh yes, you have sheep's clothing, but internally you are a wool. Bossy, authoritative, aggressive. Never noticing the weakness of the wife, the infirmity of the wife. Never thinking about the need of the wife as well. Only my need, only my food, only what I want. I am the boss, I am the leader. Be cool, there's another head in heaven. It's watching you. We then that are strong ought to bear the infirmities of the weak and not to please ourselves. Let every one of us please his neighbor for his good to edification. And man, if you can't please your wife to start with, you'll never please anybody else. Where do we get this attitude and spirit? Where we say, oh no, I'm not going to do anything to please any pastor. I know, I know what he wants. I know what he wants. I know he wants us to do it like this and do it like this. But you know, I make up my mind. I will never please anybody. I only want to please God. You'll never please God. Please his neighbor. To edification. Building up. Constructing. Working it together. Where did you get that spirit of a disciple? 
that will say, I will never please anybody. Now those uh, people in the church, they're asking me, come, I know, I know they will like it if I just go to visit them and I go to pray with them. And I say, well, very sorry about this. I know that's what they want. They want sympathy. That will please them. I will never please any church member. Where did you get that? I know that person I'm working with. I know what he wants. When I come in the morning, get the floor cleaned up, arrange all the table, and then do this and do that, put that pile there, put that one there. I know it will please him. He wants to be pleased, not me. I'm a Christian. I'm a child of God. And I have given my life to the Lord. I am not going to please anybody. You have not started yet. Oh, I know that husband. I know what he wants. I know the type of food he likes. I know the things he's expecting from me. He thinks I'm going to please him. Oh no, I'm only going to please God that I don't see. These people that I see, husband, wife, neighbor, anybody, I will not please anybody. They will know I'm a man of my word. I'm a woman of my opinion. You are not a disciple yet. You are telling us that you will never deny yourself to please anybody. You are telling us that you will never go along with the body of Christ so that the body of, the, of Christ can be, can be glorified and edified. It says, let every one of us please his neighbor so it's good to edification. For even Christ, please not himself, Christ the Lord, Christ the Master, the one that has saved us, the one that went before us and said, have you seen what I've done for you? I have taken the bowl of water and washed your feet. Did I please myself? I am among you as one that serveth. So do to other people around you. If ye know these things, happy are ye if ye do them. For even Christ pleased not himself. When last did you displease yourself to please your pastor? Oh yes, that pastor, I would have pleased him, but he's not very intelligent. Yes, ye that are strong ought to look at the infirmities of the weak pastor and not to please yourself. Oh yes, I would have pleased that pastor, but his demands are unreasonable, untimely, unfair. You know, every time he makes a demand, he says, now let's go out for evangelism, let's do this. I, I even wonder whether he has common sense. Everything he says every time is untimely. We're going to evangelize now, he knows we're tired. We're now going to do this now. He knows we have no job. That's unrealistic. That's why we're not pleasing him. When he becomes a pastor of common sense and he knows what to say at the right time and now he's perfect and complete, he has no infirmity, will please him. You've never read the Bible. Look at it again. We'll read it again. We're not traveling anywhere. We're here today. If it takes us hours, we'll keep on reading it. We'll understand. Verse 1. We then that are strong ought to bear the infirmities of the weak, the idiosyncrasies of the weak, the unrealistic, unfair, untimely demands and utterances of that weak person, the weak pastor, and not to please ourselves. And you ever imagine then that a member of a real true church who is a real disciple because of the pastor, district pastor or the overseer of the stage staying saying something very simple and saying brethren let's get up in time look at this our church we need to build this our church and if those of us say at least we are working and some of you on level eight some of you on level 10 some of you on level five if all of us here will pay our tithe and add maybe let's say one tenth on top of it we'll build this church at least we are going to use it to worship in. That's all the pastor has said. And then somebody now goes behind and then tells other people, like politics, how unreasonable is that? What the pastor said. Well, I felt that's reasonable. It's telling us that we should build that church. No, it's not reasonable. You are, you are doing eye service. You want the pastor to say that you are the good member of the church. Why don't you speak the truth? Isn't it inconvenient? Yes, it's inconvenient. Who told you that it will be easy every time? Sometimes it will be inconvenient. Wasn't the cross inconvenient? Wasn't the way to Calvary inconvenient? 
Wasn't the nailing of the hand of Jesus to the cross inconvenient? Wasn't the putting of the crown of thorns upon his head inconvenient? Wasn't all the reproach of the enemy saying, you say you are Christ, come down from the cross. Wasn't that inconvenient? Why are you talking about inconvenience? Oh yes, it's inconvenient. I pray you have more inconvenience for Christ. More inconvenience than go on the Calvary road and die on the way to Calvary. Why do you want to have a life of ease, a life of convenience, a life of luxury? And then this man will go around and tell all the other members of the church and will begin to do his own type of evangelism for the devil. Isn't that inconvenient? Yes, it is. Isn't that unreasonable? I think sometimes it may be unreasonable. Thank God that some of the commandments of the Lord will be unreasonable to the people of flesh and blood. I think it was unreasonable when God said, Abraham, leave your country, leave your people where you are. Oh Lord, where am I going to live? I have servants, I have wife, I have nephew, I have everybody. I can't show you here, but pack all your load, put it on your head, put it on your shoulder. I'll show you where you will be. And he packed out, leaving certainty for uncertainty. I think that's unfair. I think that's unreasonable. I think that might be untimely, but that man Abraham, he obeyed God. That's the Bible. And if we're still children of God, if we're still disciples of the Lord Jesus Christ, sometimes it sounds unreasonable. Sometimes it sounds unfair. Sometimes it, look un it looks untimely. That man, Father Abraham, he waited for the child, how many years? 25 years. All along the way, he made a terrible, costly mistake. And he had Ishmael. But then, after he got Ishmael, now no child has come. Eventually, Sarah became pregnant. And you know what happened? God said, listen to the wife of that woman, Sarah, and drive out the bondwoman. Oh Lord, that's unfair. That woman will rejoice over me. That woman will say, uh -huh, I said so, and it's not good for a wife to tell husband like that. Lord, save my face, save my personality. Don't let this woman rejoice over me. Oh no, Abraham, do that. And he did. And after he had sent away Hagar and sent away Ishmael, now God said, Abraham, here am I. Take your son, your only son, whom you love very dearly. And I'll show you the mountain where you're sacrificing for a burnt offering. Lord, is that fair? I don't think it's fair, but God said so. Lord, is that reasonable? I don't think it's completely reasonable to a man of flesh and blood, but God said so. Lord, is that timely? Look how old I am. Look how long I've waited. And look what you have told me. You told me to send away Ishmael, the only one that remained now. You told me to sacrifice him. Lord, is this timely? I don't think so, but he obeyed. That's discipleship. That when, when you think about the commandments of the Lord, who do you think you are? What brain do you have to understand? The words of the eternal God. The words of the ancient of days. The words of the master of angels and master of the whole universe. Do I have the brain to understand God completely? I don't think so. Do I have the knowledge to understand God completely? I don't think so. So when God tells me something, sometimes, maybe even very many times, it's going to sound unreasonable, unfair, untimely, unpleasant, and yet... A disciple, what do I do? Self-denial. I will not please myself. Do you know how unreasonable it was? When God told those Jews and said, Go to the Gentiles and let the Jews and the Gentiles become one body. Oh, it was some fear. Unreasonable and untimely. We have enough persecution from the Jews already. If we do that, they'll think that now we're not even Jews anymore. The persecution is going to get to a higher height. But then, we're not pleasing ourselves. Lord, thy will be done. How do you say you're a disciple? And you never one time displease yourself to please God, to please the brethren, to please the church of the living God. Why are you carrying your opinion on your chest, on your heart, on your head, on your shoulder? Wearing your opinion as a gap. Everywhere you go, this is my opinion. Who wants to see your opinion? Bury it. And if you have no opinion anymore, praise the Lord. That's a man that is not fully dead. Dead to the world, dead to sin, dead to self. And he says, Lord, not my will, not my way. Not what I want, but what you want. 
Let's go back to Luke chapter 9. I'm looking at verse 23. And he said unto them all, If any man will come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. Take up his cross daily. What's the cross? It's something that crosses you. Something that contradicts you. Something that is a reproach. Something that has to be endured. Whenever you think about the cross, you are not thinking of something that is so good and so nice and so polished that somebody carries for you. Somebody that brings something that brings a lot of joy. No, not initially, not superficially. Look at Hebrews chapter 12. And verse 2, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross. You know what you do with the cross? It's something to endure. It's something to endure. Think about it. The cross is something to endure. Look up here. I've never found anybody, listen to me very well, I've never found anybody who left the workers and told the pastor of that church and said, Pastor, please release me. I don't want to be a worker anymore. I'll just be coming to church. Please release me. You know the reason why? There is something that he needs to endure that he doesn't want to endure. Think about it. We've been working together. Come strain us. Becomes difficult. Becomes time consuming. And becomes very demanding. And there is something, there is a cross to endure. And this man is not willing to endure anything. He wants to live a life of ease, a life of convenience, a life of luxury, no inconvenience at all. When it gets to that point and he says, well, I don't think I can take anymore. I don't think I can do anymore. That's when he comes to the pastor and he says, well, please have me excuse. Release me. I think I cannot endure more. You know that? He's not bearing the cross. The cross is something to endure. That thing that bothered you, that thing that was so weighty on you, that you say, well, I don't think I can continue. I don't think I can bear that. That is the thing, the cross that the Lord is saying, if you are going to be a disciple, take up that cross. And if you read that passage in Luke very well, bear your cross daily. That's not the end. When we have been married, how did we get married? In the midst of joy and jubilation and laughter and smile and eating and happiness and everything that was good. And we went to the altar. Will you take this man as your lawfully wedded man and keep to him and embrace him and love him and cherish him and care for him and with no other person? Oh yes, I do. Man, will you take this woman as your lawfully wedded wife and you'll care for her, you'll love her, you'll embrace her to the exclusion of all others? Yes, I do. Then we part to the home. We smile, we eat, we sleep, we talk, we do everything, we plan. Then there comes a time that the woman said, even though the man has not died, I, I won't continue with that man. I'm going to leave this man. Ah, sister, you are a Christian. Your husband is a Christian. I cannot go along. I'm packing out. You know what that means? There is something, there is a cross to endure. And that person is saying, this cross is too heavy. I know it's mine. You know it's yours. Your husband is your husband. Those things that are happening there, I'm not supposed to come and bear that to your family for you. Your sister is not supposed to come and bear that for you if you have been saying, I don't even know my cross. That's yours. That's yours. Your name is there. Your title is there. That's your home. That's your husband. All those foolishness and idiosyncrasies and all the infirmities of that man, that is it. That's yours. Your name is there. That's your home. But when it comes to the point you say, no, I, will, I may not marry other people because of the doctrine, but I will get out of that house. Then you are saying that there is a cross you do not want to endure. It has come to the climax. It has come to the day that you say, I will not go along with that man anymore. Or it may be the man. 
And what is it we are not able to endure? The food was not ready in time. As her husband, when I felt the need of the body, so that I can satisfy the need of my body with this a wife, the woman said, well, you know I'm sick now, you know I'm tired now, my head has been making noise, you know, since morning, and you know, I mean, you are a human being, be reasonable, I'm not well. Ah, look, I won't go out to meet prostitutes outside, and if you don't accept, pack your load and go out. I said I wanted to satisfy myself, and you said you are not ready now. Okay, if you are not ready, let me know I'm not married. Pack your load and go. You know what? There is something to endure that a man cannot endure. And he says, if I cannot have my way, if I cannot do what I want whenever I want, whether you are dying or you are sick, then pack out and go. Let us separate. And you are a Christian? And you are a disciple? A disciple of the Lord Jesus Christ will bear the cross, a disciple of the Lord Jesus Christ, he will carry that cross joyfully and willingly and he will not be grumbling all about, oh, if you knew how bad my husband is and nobody knows how bad you are yourself. You talk as if you are the angel and he is the devil and surprisingly when the other fellow talks, I think both of them have problems. When the other fellow talks, the wife is the devil and he is angel Gabriel. God have mercy on you. But you know, if you're a real disciple, it says you will bear your cross, you will deny yourself. Then let's come back to Luke chapter 9, verse 23. And he said unto them all, If any man will come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross daily and follow me, following the Lord. But I must ask you, why do you follow the Lord to? To a dancing hall, he was never there. To a place of joy and laughter every day, that's not how he spent his life. You know the life of Jesus Christ? He was born in a manger, a lowly place. Follow him there. And he lived in a humble home with Mary and Joseph. Follow him there. And he went to the seaside and he called the common people, follow him there. Aren't you surprised that there are people in our church? And uh, we say, brother, we've established the IFL for one purpose. The purpose is that we'll be able to reach to these people at the, at the top. Well, the person said, I have a grade 2 teacher certificate. Well, we say, you are not IFL. Just go to the other house fellowship. He went to that house fellowship once. It was like a manger. So it was dirty. And he said, ah, deeper life. They put some people in a place where it's very good, where it's very nice. They call them IFL. They say, I cannot attend house fellowship there. And he told me to come and attend house fellowship in this manger where the sheep and the chicken, where they're at the backyard and they're all smelling. Not me. I will never go to house fellowship anymore. I'm a child of God, you are. Herod was a child of God too then. I'm a child of God. Pilate must have been a child of God. You're in the same position. And so he cannot attend our fellowship now because that place is too lowly for me. If they don't want me to go to the IFL, let them cancel IFL because of me. But we also have student outreach. Do you go to student outreach? No, I don't go there. I'm not a student. Why don't you go there? You're looking for something. There's pride in your heart. You cannot follow Jesus to Calvary, to the manger, to the lowly place. All you're looking for is something that is elevated and very high. What spirit is this? What attitude is this? Where are these people coming from that they say they are born again, they are children of God, and they do not have Jesus as their master? How is it that in our churches we have the multitude, the majority of the people that do not know the very first basics of discipleship and Christianity? Where is this church going? What direction are you towing? Where is the humility? Where is the self-denial? Where is the cross-bearing? Where is the following of Christ and the forsaking of all things? In Luke chapter 14 and verse 33, so likewise, whosoever he be of you that forsaketh not all that he hath, he cannot be my disciple. 
whosoever he be that cannot forsake all that he has. Oh, you said I've forsaken all. You have not. Everywhere you go, you carry your badge and your certificate in your heart. And you tell everybody, you know, I'm a graduate. You know I'm an engineer. And so what? You're the first engineer to be in Nigeria. Don't we have engineers in Catholic Church, in Celestial? Don't we have engineers and lawyers among the, among the Jehovah's Witnesses? So what? what's the deal? I'm an engineer. Bury that. Let's know who Christians are. Let's know the people that, for, that are forsaking all these things of the world and they are following the Lord Jesus Christ to Calvary. Let's know the people that even when they are crucifying them, they keep their mouth shut. When they were crucifying Jesus, was he saying, I'm the eternal one, the child that is born, the son that is given, the one on whom the government shall be upon his shoulder? Was he parading that? Wasn't he very lowly? Let this might be, you which was also in Christ. Who even though he was equal with God, he made himself of no reputation. But he humbled himself to the very death of the cross. And having taken on the form of man, he became a servant. And he told his own disciples, I am among you as he that serveth. Now we cannot serve. Now we cannot be lowly before other people. Now we cannot be gentle with other people. Now we cannot be humble. Why do we say we are disciples? We are children of God. We are following the Lord. Then it says we should love. Love the brethren. In John chapter 13. Verse 34. A new commandment I give unto you, that ye love one another as I have loved you, that ye also love one another. By day shall all men know that ye are my disciples, if ye have love one to another. We're talking of practical love that we can see, that we can feel. Practical love that is very beneficial to one another. Caring for one another, caring for one another. We're not talking about people that form gangs in the house of God. We come to workers meeting like this. And there you find the Ebos, twos and threes, separate. The Yorubas, threes and fours, together. Among the Yorubas themselves, you find the Jebus and the Egbas, separated. They love one another. They're segregated. You find uh, the Kales and you find the Jebus also. They're separated. And then you go to the East and they make a difference between real Igbo and low Igbo and the outcast Igbo and the real inward kingdom Igbo. We're not talking about that. We're not talking about people that will divide the church into 1,000 segments. But the people that love, the people that love. Disciples indeed, a new commandment I give unto you that ye love one another. Now, if you love one another, you'll not be cutting down one another, criticizing one another, burying one another, and you will not be destroying one church in another state so as to build your own ego and so as to know that your own church, your deeper life church in your own state is number one. All the other deeper life churches in other states, they are inferior. That's not Christianity. But in love, in honor, you esteem one another. And it says, by this shall all men know that ye are my disciples, when ye have love one for another. We're not talking about the people that have uh, money, material things. They cannot help anybody. They're stingy. And they, they cannot play with money. If five naira brings you together, connects you with another person, and he says he's a brother, he will say, well, if you don't pay me, I'll tell the pastor. If the pastor doesn't do anything about it, I, will, I know how to deal with you. At least I was in the world before. And I've not forgot. And if you think you can cheat me because I'm a Christian, <laughs> you meet something. I will show you I'm a Christian with a but. That's Christian. And they take one another to court. They report one another to unbelievers. And they go all about all the secrets between them they are they are members of the same church all the secrets between them you hear it in assemblies of god you hear it in first choir. you hear it in anglican church you hear it in a methodist church you even hear it in celestial 
and they say, we know those, ah, it's not a Cyprian and a so-and-so. Are they not members of deeper life? Ah, we know the trouble between them. They were business partners together before, but ah, we know what happened. That's Christianity. We cannot endure anything. We cannot love one another. If money connects us together, we almost kill one another. Have you heard of those who will fast and pray because of brother so-and-so? I know I cannot take him to court. I know that I cannot do anything against him, but I will pray. So you are cherubim and seraphim. Now you burn candle on them. You blow incense on them. And by seven days, you've been burning that candle on them. They will see, if they don't pay you, members of the same church. That's Christianity. These people are backslidden. They've gone away from the fold. They're still there. Ezekiel, the people come as my people. They say it as my people. But the word of God is not important to them because their hearts will still follow after their covetousness. Love will forgive one another. Love will forbear with one another. Love will be constructive and protective. Love will be cautious and polite. Love will never do anything evil to anybody. Love will be transparent. Oh, Christianity. Two brothers are talking. Another brother is coming. Let's round up. Let him pass. Brother, how are you? How are you? Uh, you came to the retreat also? How wonderful. I'm so happy to meet you. How's the work in the state now? Well, fine, fine. Okay, bye-bye. After that, as we were saying before, uh, you know, that's what we are discussing. That's Christianity. That's Christianity. Two sisters are talking. And as we are talking, another sister is coming. And she says, uh, okay, well, we'll continue later. I say, sister, welcome. How are you? You came to the retreat? Wonderful. I didn't see you last time we came for Congress. What happened to you? Well, then they answered one another. Uh, I hope everything is fine now. I see your husband. How are the children? And uh, where you were walking before, you're still walking there. Oh, yes, I'm still walking there. Okay, bye bye. We'll see you again. Oh, we thank God. This walker, isn't this walker's retreat wonderful? Did you enjoy it? Oh, yes, we enjoyed it. Bye bye. Thank you. Now, sisters, I was talking because, you know, these people, you don't know who is who. If you just, you know, say everything you have and gets into their hands, you don't know. You're just here at Ibada. You're here at. Uh, you're here at um, Benin. So that's why we should be careful. The Bible says we should be wise as serpents. Wise as serpents. Is it among the people that are outside you are to be wise as serpents? Or among your fellow brother, your fellow sister? Love should be transparent and very, very sincere. And love should be Christ-like and constant. Where do you stand this afternoon? Are you a disciple? Rise up and tell the Lord where you are. True discipleship. Do you still believe the whole Bible? Amen. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Our Father, we thank you because we are great God. We bless you because of your word you have exposed to us. Father, we are praying as we have called upon you this afternoon that we live according to the prayers we have prayed unto you in Jesus' name. Amen. You have called us to higher consecration to follow you because the Bible says it is enough for the disciples to be like his master. A servant to be like his Lord. We are praying that in our daily life we will be exactly like Christ in Jesus' name. Amen. Almighty God, we know we see temptations every day. Father, we are praying the grace is always, is always available to live above temptations. We are praying that none of us will fall into any temptation in Jesus' name. Amen. If we don't live like Christ, what shall we do and what shall we be? What will be the end of our lives? We are praying that by your grace, by your power, we pray yesterday and you led us to the victory of Christ. We are praying that you lead us to the consecration of Jesus this afternoon in Jesus' name. Amen. Father, we know any life short of this is incomplete.